All right, hello everyone. Welcome back to week two of C++ for Java programmers. Uh, we've got a couple of things nailed down regarding just course logistics. First, office hours. Uh, after looking at the results of the survey, um, I'm going to be having office hours kind of in the mid-afternoon, 2 p.m., Monday through Friday. There'll be a couple of Fridays uh, where I'll be gone, but I'll give you guys a heads up when that's going to be coming up. Our TA, Kane Rodriguez, will be having office hours bright and early at 8 a.m. and at 4.30, Monday through Thursday. Uh, I know we've listed uh, start times, but there's not an end time to this. What we're going to do is just, uh, we'll show up, I'll be there at 2 p.m. Uh, if there's anybody waiting in our office hour ticket queue, let me pull that up for a second and just walk you through this. So, put it on the right screen. There we go. Here's our Canvas course for the page, right here under office hours. If you want to come visit us at office hours and get some help, just click on the ticket queue link right here. Let me open that up. It asks you a few questions, your email address, your name, uh, send us a meeting link, uh, your login ID, what kind of question you have, what question do you have. Um, question types are just like conceptual debugging, course logistics. And um, that's going to help us prioritize who we want to meet with uh, in what order. Um, but in general, we'll just meet with people in the order they arrive. Uh, if there's uh, no one waiting, so our goal is to have office hours like lots of times during the day. And then we'll meet with whoever's there. And if there's no one there, we will hang out for a few minutes, you know. Um, but if no one needs help at 8 a.m. on Thursday, uh, we're just going to cancel office hours. Uh, if no one's there at 8 a.m. on Friday, we'll um, go ahead and cancel them. But as things get busier, we want to have the opportunity for you guys to, like, realize you need help. And you can go look and see, oh, the next office hours are just in a few hours. Um, so that's kind of the idea. If no one comes, then uh, they're canceled. So we're not going to wait around for a full hour. We're going to just schedule more office hours, more times when we'll check in and see if there's anybody who's basically scheduled one of these appointments with us. All right, next up. Oh, that's office hours. Please sign up for Piazza if you've not already done so. We've got about 90% of the class already in there, so that's excellent. Um, uh, with regard to the survey, most people have taken the survey also. Please note that the auto grader is going to give you a zero, um, or it won't display the grade at all. I'm not sure if you guys can see it or not. And uh, we've had some people who recently added the class, some people dropped, new people have come. Uh, we're going to give them some time to take the survey, do the first project, and we'll grade all of the survey when we do homework one, and uh, just do it all at once. Speaking of homework one, that is due tomorrow night. Uh, today is Wednesday, that's Thursday evening. Um, let's see, uh, September 10th. Please make sure you go ahead and get that turned in on time. This homework, uh, I'd like to, I really hope was very easy for you guys. Or for those people who it's not easy, it is probably the most difficult homework. If you can't get the compiler to work, that can be one of the most frustrating things we'll deal with all semester. Um, homework 1B, part, part B of this, uh, will be released tomorrow by the end of day. It's going to be due the following Thursday, September 17th. This is just, uh, do I really belong in this class? Um, it's going to be taking advantage of some uh, basic programming skills you've learned from another class. The ability to write a loop, to go through a string. Um, I'm going to be talking about strings and input and output, C in and C out, how to get user input from the, from the user and write to the console um, in today's lecture. But um, if this is a challenge for you guys, then maybe this isn't the right class for you because it's going to get much more difficult from here. So that's kind of what I was looking for with my second like part of homework one is just uh, a way for you guys to judge the difficulty. Am I going to be in way over my head if I don't have enough experience? All right, and then um, with regard to Piazza, as you guys run into trouble, if you're having trouble getting the compiler to work or you come up with some sort of cryptic, weird error message, go ahead and post a screenshot of that message on Piazza and we can walk you through what it means. There are some weird ones out there that pop up quite frequently. If you need to post code that goes along with it, um, we'll either ask you to send you us an email um, in the, as the Piazza response, or you can just go ahead and post that uh, privately. All right. So for today's lecture, I've got a couple of topics I want to delve into. First, I want to go into some history, compare C++ to Java, and just talk about the development and the design philosophies behind these two languages. And a lot of that will answer a number of questions about why did they do it that way? Why is this so different? Um, and they almost all boil down to performance and how easy it is to, to make mistakes. And then uh, I want to talk about strings and uh, input output with stream operators. So that's the plan for today. It's a little bit weird order to, to, to do these topics in. I'm moving some things that I would like to do like conceptually first, 
um, because we need them for this homework assignment. So maybe it's not such a weird order. All right, so I want to just jump in and talk a little bit about the history and just compare C++ to Java. So for a long time, um, and maybe I like to think of it as not so long ago, but I'm old, um, C++ was the language of choice for computer science courses. Uh, it's an object-oriented programming uh, that lets us use classes to create objects. Um, it's seen widespread industry adoption. There's a lot of software out there, a lot of software companies that are hiring C++ programmers. It's the only thing I've ever used as a software engineer. The entire code base for our software was written in C++. And even before that, as a graduate student, all of my work in physics-based simulation was done with C++. And the number one reason for that language choice was performance. There's some aspect of our code that we wanted to go incredibly fast, and therefore C++ was the, the number one choice. Um, it's a very efficient programming language. On the other hand, it is also one of the most complex programming languages out there. There's a lot of little syntax and technical details that we need to get exactly right or we're going to run in trouble. All right, now a little bit about Java. Just my personal background with Java, it's been almost nine years since I learned Java. And the stuff that I've learned may be a little bit out of date or maybe remembering it incorrectly. The textbook that I'm using is my sort of guide for the, basically I'm taking the table of contents, but it's got some good stuff in there. But that was written in 2004. So it's now 16 years out of date. And Java has seen some major updates. Um, and I'm going to get some things wrong during this semester. When I say something that's incorrect or that they've upgraded, please let me know in the comments and I will make a correction. Um, I'm going to do my best for you guys, though. Uh, all right. Um, so Java is actually very similar to a lot of C++'s uh, structure. We've got very similar basic expressions, expressions like conditionals, loops. Those are almost identical. It's also an object-oriented programming language. But in general, the syntax is much easier. And for every uh, construct that we see in Java, C++ almost certainly has a corresponding construct that does almost the same thing. Um, so it's possible to translate from Java to C++ pretty easily. That said, uh, C++ tends to have more options, and not all of them directly translate into Java. So Java is like taken a subset of the really useful stuff from C++ and incorporated it, but it didn't get everything. Uh, Java has seen really widespread use in introductory computer science courses. Uh, it's a great language to learn, and it does really help you a lot with the debugging and preventing you from making horrendous mistakes, where C++ doesn't stop you. And with that in mind, I just want to take a little bit of uh, the history. So to do that, we're going to delve back and start with uh, the C programming language. It was developed in uh, 1972 at Bell Rabs by Dennis Richty. He was uh, working on developing the Unix operating system. Uh, previously, operating systems were all written in assembly just because the compilers uh, that they had back then did not generate efficient enough code. So he was working on the C programming language as a way to create operating systems using this programming language. Uh, with that in mind, he needed the compiler to generate efficient code. And so he wanted the programmers to have access to as many low-level details as possible so they could write the best quality C code to be turned into efficient you know, <clears throat> assembly code. Uh, so things like pointers and pointer arithmetic were available. Uh, direct memory access, we can just say, hey, give me a chunk of memory right here. And the system says, okay, here you go. You can use it for whatever you want. Um, we've got increment operators, bitwise operators, so we can use direct math in hexadecimal or direct math in binary, um, yeah, hexadecimal constants. And this allowed the programmers of the day to generate efficient enough code to generate the operating system Unix. Uh, back then, uh, compiling was extremely slow. We're talking maybe three to four lines per second. And many users would share the same machine all connected with those dumb terminals. Uh, I addressed this in my terminal uh, video along with um, homework 1A. So if you check that out, um, in general, programmers needed to be experts in order to write the, oh, wait a second, back up, Mike. Compiling was extremely slow. We're talking four lines per second. The code base for the startup company that I worked on, we made software that engineers would use to help design parts, um, was about 120,000 lines long. That means every time I type a few lines of code and wanted to compile it and just check and see if it worked, it took almost 50 minutes on a machine from uh, that era. 
In addition, I would have to wait for the transfer time to transfer my code to the mainframe and then transfer it back. And that might be 10 characters per second, something incredibly slow. So we're talking several hours to compile our code base every time I made a little change. Um, on the local machine I had it at work, well, it was uh, 36 seconds to compile the entire thing. So we've seen dramatic improvements in speed. Um, all right, so when you're working in C, uh, the programmers really did need to be experts. They needed to write the most efficient possible code. Um, I've got an example of that right here on the next slide. There it is. Okay, so take a look at this. Um, see if you can figure out what this one line of code does. Uh, these stars are actually pointer D references. If you're not familiar with pointers, just fast forward to the explanation. If you've seen a uh, pointer uh, in a class somewhere, give this a little, you know, pause the video, see if you can figure out what this is doing. And I'll be right back with an explanation. All right, if you guessed string copy, you are correct. So check it out, there's a lot going on here. First, we have a while loop. But the while loop has an empty body. It's just got a single semicolon there indicating that the body is empty. So all of the action is actually taking place inside the conditional, the condition statement of the while loop. So as we look here, we're seeing that we're also using an assignment statement inside the condition. Now in C, an assignment statement actually uh, returns the value that's assigned. So as long as it's not zero, because uh, C and C++ will treat zero as false and everything else is true. So as long as we have not assigned the value zero, it's gonna to continue to go through this loop and evaluate this statement over and over and over again. So what we're doing here, if I look over here on the queue side, I've got a, an array queue, um, or in this case, a string of characters, an array of characters. I'm dereferencing that with the star to get the value of the very first character. I take that value and then I'm going to assign it to the other string. Um, the dereferenced uh, string P or character array. And then once I've made that assignment, I see if it's zero, which is the null terminating character of a string. If it's zero, I'm done. I've copied the entire string. If it's a letter, then I'm not finished copying the string and I need to increment both pointers so that they point to the very next um, element of the string, next character, and we'll copy that one. So there's a lot going on here. Uh, in this one line of code, we're seeing an assignment in a conditional, the increment operators, we're um, dereferencing pointers, we're getting uh, character data, that we have an empty body of a while loop. This makes some assumptions too, two big ones. First, it assumes that our string Q is actually terminated with zero to indicate the end of the string. Um, and it also assumes that the array P has enough space to hold the entire string Q. Um, so those are some big assumptions there too. Um, this is part of the reason that programmers really did need to be experts. Uh, all error checking was the responsibility of the programmer, not the compiler. Um, so just making sure that there's enough space in an array. C and C++ will not tell you that you've run out of space, that you're overwriting the um, array boundaries. Um, they will not check to see if uh, your variables have been initialized correctly. It will not check to see if you've put in a string that's null terminated in Q. It could just be, if you've never actually used that memory before, it's just declared some space, it may not have uh, a, a null terminal character in the uh, immediate vicinity. You could copy millions of characters before you get to one of them. Um, so it's uh, tricky to get correct. There's no checking. It doesn't help you uh, find those common mistakes. All right. Um, yeah. Yeah, in fact, as far as efficiency goes, programmers could even suggest the use of particular registers on the CPUs. I thought that was just fascinating. All right, so I'm gonna move on. And following the development of C, um, Bjarne Strasrup, Strasrup, I'm not sure, I think that's close, um, developed uh, C beginning in 1979. It's based on C, I mean, developed C++ based on C. Uh, it was first standardized almost 20 years after that in 1998, and we've seen several other uh, standardized versions come out where they've added new features. Uh, he was working at Bell Labs and was looking for an object-oriented version of C uh, designed to be upward compatible. So he wanted to be able to take C code and have it run in C++. So with that goal, a lot of what we see as regular C will work in C++. There's a couple of exceptions. Because C++ is object-oriented, we've added some reserved words like class. 
So any original C code that happened to use the word class anywhere, like for a variable name or something, is going to cause that uh, C++ compiler to crash because it's expecting the word class to be reserved and used for creating you know, classes and objects. Um, so as much as possible, we've seen that C++ um, tries to make C code work. Uh, C is very fast and probably the most efficient language out there uh, for as high-level languages go. Um, so with that goal in mind that we want, it to, we want C code to work, they have reserved very few extra well, reserved keywords. Now, so minimal extra reserved keywords. Uh, and the C++ community has been reluctant to reserve even more words. So instead, what we're going to do as they add features to C++ is to continue to use reserved keywords uh, like const and static and throw. They'll just use const in like six different ways. And depending on the context, it means something different. But that way, at least I'm not adding a new reserved keyword. So we'll see some little tr things that look a little weird because of that design philosophy. And hopefully when you recognize that they use this again because they didn't want to add a new keyword, uh, it explains why. All right. Uh, the second goal was to write a programming language that goes as fast as C and can do exactly the same thing. It goes as fast as C programs do when doing the exact same thing. Uh, basically, why would you want to learn a language that's slower than C? The, you wouldn't. So we need our language to go as fast as C can. So with that in mind, we, we adopted some of the same things that C does to make it go fast. There's no runtime bounds checking on arrays. There's no garbage collection. That's where if I've reserved some memory uh, with a new, uh, it doesn't take it back, um, doesn't delete it. So a new would be in Java. Um, if we've used malloc to reserve some memory in C++, we have to be the ones to free it. Um, so no garbage collection. There's no dy dynamic dispatch. That's where if we have a series of items, objects that are inherited from a derived class, and we've assigned them to variables in the drive class, it's uh, not going to check to see what kind it is and find the right function. So basically, it's the selection of polymorphic operation at runtime. If that didn't make sense, that's going to be like lecture 11. We'll go into great detail about how that works in C++, how you can get around this and make it happen with the virtual keyword. Um, Otherwise, just, just be aware that they've done some stuff to make it go fast. Um, all right, and there are also some things that are not specified in the language and just sort of depend on what hardware the computer is running on and what the compiler has made a choice about. So the description of the language, for example, doesn't describe what to do um, with the bit shift. So if I do a bit shift um, to the right, is it going to shift in a zero or does it shift the sign bit? And that happens to be hardware dependent. Um, the rounding of negative numbers is also dependent on the system. Does it round a negative number toward zero or toward negative infinity? Check out this one. So in this code right here, I've got two increment operators. Uh, the description of C++, the language specification, doesn't tell me which one of these happens first. In this particular loop, it doesn't matter. That's not important. But uh, in other cases, it might be. And uh, the final thing, is it the final one? Yep, the final one is that the uh, size of an int uh, is not specified either. It's just guaranteed to be larger than or equal to a short. And we'll find out for modern compilers and modern computers, uh, an int is almost always of size 4 bytes. Alright, so just some little things that uh, they're not specified and rely on the hardware to make them go fast. Alright, uh, now on to Java. Uh, James Gosling developed Java beginning in 1995 while working at Sun Microsystems. His goal was to create a language uh, with simpler syntax. He wanted it to be possible to do the same programs that could be written in C++. Uh, so, as an example, C++ might have many ways to do a particular task. When he designed Java, he took the most common version of the programming constructs from C++ and put them into Java. So not all C++ features have been added to Java, just the ones that you use all the time. Um, he also made it more difficult to write incorrect code. The compiler is going to go ahead and detect lots of different kinds of errors at compile time, like if a variable has not been uh, declared or uh, initialized, or if you're accessing something out of bounds of an array. Um, and the virtual machine will throw exceptions when bad things happen at runtime. So we've got compile time detection of errors and the ability to fix things at runtime. Uh, i got to admit that 
when I did write Java code, I abused that horribly, and I did not have the greatest of style, but I really enjoyed having that power available to me. All right, so now just some high-level differences. My list here is not in the same order, but I found this awesome slide that has like all of them in one spot, and I stole it from Dataflare, so thank you, Dataflare. Um, but anyway, in no particular order, the high-level difference is the big one. C++ is designed for correct code to run as fast as possible. And it's an extension of C that adds objects. Java is designed to allow uh, to not allow incorrect programs to run, and speed is a secondary goal. Just they wanted to make it easier to write correct programs. I think those are the two major differences. If I'm just like trying to describe why I would choose one over the other. All right. See, platform dependence. Uh, C++ depends exactly on where we run it. Java, not so much. On uh, part of that is the compiled versus interpreted um, point here. Um, C++ is going to generate native machine code. This is going to let it run as fast as possible on the machine that it's uh, compiled for. And downside is it will generally not be transferable to any other platform. In fact, when Java was released, the compiled code generated by C++ was 50 times faster. Today, Java speed has significantly improved, and reasonable code runs exactly the same speed as reasonable C++ code. Uh, highly optimized C++ code will still blow Java out of the water, and a lot of that is because there are no runtime checks for correctness. Um, Java, on the other hand, uh, the compiler will actually compile it to Java bytecode, which runs on the virtual machine. So, um, and then that uh, Java virtual machine is an interpreter that at runtime will take the Java bytecode, interpret it, and run it line by line. This makes it, in theory, um, more portable so that Java code can be run on more or less any machine. All right, so f as far as security and robustness goes, there's a couple of things here that refer to security. Um, when we look at the memory, it's possible to access memory in C++ that's been returned to the heap. You know, if I've used new and delete, but I've reserved a pointer to something I've deleted, I can still go right to that memory. That's known as a stale pointer. Uh, so that's a, an easy mistake to make uh, and a potential security violation. Uh, there's no automatic garbage collection, so it's up to the programmer to remember to return the memory with a delete or free. Uh, and programmers, and when I say programmers, I'm almost always talking about myself. Programmers are surprisingly bad at memory management. It's incredibly difficult to like keep track of everything and return all the memory to the system. There's absolutely no array index checking. And this is a favorite tool of hackers. They can look for code that reads in a string, like maybe your username and password, and all they need to do is put in a longer string than we've reserved space for. And then this will let us overwrite other variables. This is known as a buffer overflow attack. Maybe you'll do an example of this uh, in the future lecture. Um, I know if you take computer security, uh, they definitely do this as a homework assignment. Uh, it was a lot of fun. All right, so let's see. Typecasting can go horribly wrong, too. I can reserve some memory, store some integers there, and then change it to characters and read it back as characters if I want. There's a lot of reasons I might want to do that. I can use the smaller character data type you know, one byte or two bytes, depending on which character version I'm looking at, to do math with smaller numbers, and I don't waste as much memory. If I'm working on a machine like an embedded CPU on a car or something that doesn't have like the gigabytes of memory my home computer does, that might be an advantage. Um, so it's permitted, but it can, it's one of those things that can go wrong if you're not careful. Let's see, default initialization, uh, default arguments. Um, absolutely not, C++ doesn't have that. If I just create index and then print it out, I'm going to get whatever garbage was stored in that memory location if I haven't initialized it. Uh, I think a lot of times is this is uh, deceptive and tricky because I think the operating system will frequently, when it gives you know memory to a computer to use, will zero out everything just so that you can't read what the previous program had been doing with that memory. And so you may have a lot of memory that starts out all zeros, but as the program runs, it may be used. And so as you declare new variables, you may be reusing memory that you've just written to, and it will not be default initialized to zero or the empty string. Um, then finally, yeah, the memory model. Uh, oh, there's another page. This is not finally, sorry. Memory model. Uh, C++ is going to permit us to use pointers. And we can have structures and unions. A union is sort of a composite data type 
where I can say sometimes it's going to be uh, three integers, sometimes it's going to be three floats, um, and lets us use it that reserved space of memory in more than one way. Um, C++ permits call by reference, but not in Java. Um, C++ supports the go-to statement, whereas Java doesn't. I'm a big fan of the go-to statement. I want to teach you guys how to use it correctly in this class. So many classes I've taken have said, uh, don't ever write state go-to statements. Uh, I don't know. I remember seeing that all the way through my undergraduate education. Don't write go-to statements. But if you use it right, um, it's a powerful tool. All right, um, let's see here. Multiple inheritance, where uh, well, a class can inherit from more than one parent class. C++ permits that. We'll go into great detail about how this works and the problems that it generates. And Java permits this also, but you have to achieve this through using interfaces. Um, operator overloading is another feature of C++ that's going to allow us to take the new classes that we've generated, uh, it is object-oriented, and then use the operators, just simple operators like plus. You know, I can take 1 plus 2, that's going to be addition if I'm using integers. And it can, I can rewrite what the plus will do for new types that I write, so that as I write code, I can use these new operators to act on them. That's going to be a full lecture in the second half of the course. Uh, finally, the preprocessor allows for conditional compilation. We saw an example of the preprocessor when we included, uh, using the pound sign include, right, when we included IO stream. I want to delve into a little bit of variable names because when we get user input, I want to be able to store it somewhere. So this is the briefest drive-through version of variable names, and then we'll jump into the new content. So first, variable names in C++ um, can be composed of letters, digits, and underscores, uh, and that's it, nothing else. They cannot start with a digit, so they must start with either an underscore or a letter, and a lot of times we'll see that variables that start with underscores are reserved for special purposes, like compiler variables. Um, there's no limit on length, I can have any number of characters, and it's important, I, I believe, to follow a convention so that uh, you have a pattern and you can just look at a variable and say oh that's a variable or that's a function and the one that I really enjoy using is to put all of my variable names in lowercase I'll put the function names so that each letter is capitalized um, and I'll put my class definitions in all capital letters I also really enjoy using the underscores between the words and names uh, as opposed to camel case when I write Java code I do use camel case because that's I'm not even sure why it just feels natural when I'm writing code for Java and underscores when I'm running C++. Maybe that's just just me, but uh, for my course, it's totally fine if you guys want to use camel case, if you're familiar with that. Just be consistent so that it's a pattern that you recognize and will make you more efficient at writing code. Someday when you have a real job, your boss will insist on one or the other, and 50-50, maybe you'll get lucky and it'll be one you're good with, or you might have to switch. Uh, choosing variable names that are meaningful is very important. And that's one of the things as we go through and look at the style of your code, we're going to offer suggestions on if you choose poorly. So your goal as a student is to communicate to me that you understand what's going on. And you can do that by choosing appropriate variable names. So for example, if I'm computing the area of a rectangle, I need to take the length times the width. So L times W, length times width, X times Y. Uh, I could even use H for height. Um, all of those would make great variable names. And a for area, that can use the word area, um, can use size, uh, all of those are great variable names. The worst I have ever seen, and I'm not going to tell you the name of the student, chose TT for the length, TTT for the width, and when you multiply TT times TTT, you get TTTTT. Uh, that made it incredibly hard to follow. I had no idea what he was doing. I stared at that for the longest time, and then finally figured out what was going on. So please, please, please don't do that to me. I know there's one smart ass out there who's going to come back and say, ha, 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 check this out. I know I've already passed. I can't possibly take off that many points. Please don't do that to me. Well, Kane's going to be grading for me. You're doing it to him. He's a great guy. Don't do it to him either. All right, I'm going to pause for a sec. i got office hours, and I'll be back to record the rest of this in a moment. All right, guys, I'm back. Uh, it took a little longer than I thought. A little further behind than I want to be right now. Um, this part's being re-recorded after my um, microphone difficulties, so sorry about that. A little delay. All right, so next up I want to talk about streams. Streams are how we're going to connect to input and output devices, whether it's a keyboard or the monitor or a network. 
files, um, the monitor. Uh, this is how we're going to be connecting. So basically, you can think of a stream as a physical source destination of data. I used the word characters here when I was writing this slide, but it's data. Um, bytes of whatever could be translated into characters. That's what we'll be doing for the first homework assignment and the examples today. Um, now, some characteristics of uh, streams are there's no defined length. It's just going to be a source where characters are just going to come in. They'll be in a buffer. I can read them out of the buffer into my C++ code. Um, think about streaming video as an example. Uh, when you open up Netflix, your computer starts receiving data from the internet, and it's going to play a video, and then it keeps getting more and more and more data. It plays the video. When it's done with it, it discards it. Um, <clears throat> But you can think of it as like a, just an endless stream. You can watch Netflix for days. It's just going to keep on coming. Um, there's a little buffer there. It's going to store some data. Uh, you can extract it if it's a keyboard buffer, um, whatever, file buffer. <coughs> um, and to do that, uh, to take advantage of C++'s streaming toolboxes, I like the word toolbox here. I don't think anyone else uses it that, but I like it. Uh, we're going to include three different header files. The first one is IO stream. This is going to be the basic uh, header file. This is where C in and C out are stored. So if we want to use those functions, we'll need to include them. F stream includes a bunch of options for files. We'll get into those coming up very soon, but a future lecture. And then for all of the IO manipulators, input output manipulators, if I want to format my output a certain way, all of those formatting things are going to be found in IO manip. Just uh, as we walk through these, uh, first to get input from the keyboard, the stream that we're going to be using is called CN. Uh, it's connected to the keyboard. Um, and just an example usage there, if I declare a variable, an integer in this case, x, and then I use CN, this is the stream extraction operator, that double angle bracket to the right. That's going to grab data from my toolbox here. So I type something in the keyboard, I push enter, it goes into the CN. That's a, like an object that's going to store that. It's like a buffer. I'm going to extract the data from that. And if it's an integer, uh, x, and so C++ knows all the types of everything. It's a strongly typed language. So if I'm importing something into uh, an integer, it's going to grab one integer from the keyboard um, and stick it into x. Um, we may chain these. I'll do an example of this when I do my demonstrations. And basically, that, all that means is I can have cn, double angle bracket x, double angle bracket y, double angle bracket z, and I can read in three things all with one command. Um, this will return the value of whatever is input, um, and it will return false if we see the end of line character. Uh, so if you're using uh, testing this on a Mac or your home computer, uh, that's either going to be Control Z or Control D. It's Control D for Mac and Linux. It's Control Z followed by Enter. Control Z followed by Enter on Windows. All right, the three output streams that we have. To be honest, all three of these go to the screen or console. Uh, C out is the standard one we'll be using. That's the one I'm gonna use all the time. There are two others, uh, the error and the log. Um, they go to the, the uh, um, screen also, unless you redirect them, which is pretty common for larger software projects. We probably won't even be using those during this course, but I want you guys to be aware that there's options. All right, so C out is going to be used with the stream insertion operator. We're going to be taking data from a variable using that double left angle bracket and putting it into C out. And from there, the operating system knows and all the like machinery inside the C out toolbox knows to stick it on the screen. It accepts uh, variables, text, and manipulators. So those um, manipulators are going to be something that tells it to format, you know, if we have a number, maybe format with a certain number of decimal places, a certain precision. If it's text, we could say give it a certain width box and stick it on the right side of that character box. Um, these may also be chained. This is I use this all the time. So we can uh, attach C out with a double angle bracket and then give it some text, hello world, and then we can give it the double angle bracket followed by an end line. And each one time we use the double angle bracket, uh, it's going to add another piece of whatever we're going to be outputting. Uh, couple of notes, this is buffered. That means C out is just going to remember what it should print later. And it's not going to print until the operating system is good and ready. Uh, we can force that to happen by sticking a flush, which um, forces it to be printed to the screen without doing anything else, or an end line, E-N-D-L, that's going to force it to print and it'll put a new line 
at the end of the line. The backslash n, the escaped new line character, does not force it to print to the screen. So a lot of times, if you have a problem when you're coding, there's a, an error somewhere you're trying to identify where it is, uh, I recommend, highly recommend, doing what's called scaffolding. That's going to be putting in a whole lot of print statements. And you'll just look for the last one that printed. The error happened after that. When you're one that have one that doesn't print, the error was before that. So you can like bracket where your mistake is. The problem is that if it crashes, but the text that you have sent to see out to be printed has not yet printed because the operating system is waiting, um, it's not you're not going to see it. So definitely put an end line at the end of every scaffolding statement or a flush if you do you want it to be all on one line? All right, guys, I just hopped over onto a CSL machine, and I've got a bit of code here. Uh, I just want to walk you through this very first example, and then I'm going to do, I guess, three more examples using CN. Um, so first up, to use CN, I needed to include IO stream. For all of the um, code that I write throughout this semester, I'm going to be just including this magic line using namespace std. Uh, all of these toolboxes, um, stream manipulator, C out, CN, end line over here. They all belong to the namespace standard STD, which would be just like a package in Java. And so in order to tell C++ where to look, we're going to add using namespace. So it'll search not only all the default locations, but it'll also search st STD standard for these things when it's looking for where do I get the code that does this. All right, so here's the idea. In my main function, I'm going to declare a variable x. I'm going to prompt the user with the C out. This is the stream insertion operator. I'm sending this text into C out. And when the operating system is good and ready, it's going to print that to the screen. Next thing I'm going to do is use CN and the stream extraction operator. CN is basically the keyboard. Um, so I type something, I push enter, and it's waiting right here in CN for me to go grab it. So as soon as I push enter, uh, it's going to get whatever integer I typed from the keyboard and stick it in X. It's only going to grab one integer. If I put a bunch of stuff, it's going to get the first one. Um, put that in X. And then all it's going to do is print out, uh, you entered, and then whatever number I put in. So this here is an example of operator chaining. The first thing it's going to do is execute this much code. So it'll take you entered and stick it in the stream of characters that are eventually going to be put onto the uh, screen. Then this is essentially the same as just throwing some parentheses around here. If I were to do math like this, it would give me this much. And that's going to stick you entered on the, on the uh, uh, screen. The next thing that's going to happen is this C out, angle, angle, bracket, you entered, essentially becomes a new C out, and we get the rest of this phrase, x, end line. All right, so this much in parentheses returns a new C out, which gets dumped right here which is ready lined up to go with the next stream insertion operator. So this double angle bracket always requires a stream on the left and um, something to be put into the stream on the right. So two operands. Oh, and I got a typo here. Didn't mean that. There we go. All right. So when we run this code, this much right here, let me highlight this, means it's going to take x. The stream operator knows that x is an integer. C++ is strongly typed. It knows that this is going to be a number, and it's going to use um, C out to print out that number. And C out knows how to print numbers on the screen. Okay. After that, this uh, that much code returns a new C out, and then what's left is just this much, and that's going to print the end line and flush the buffer so that it gets printed right then immediately. So this sort of, um, I'm going to call it simplification. If I were doing algebra and just adding some numbers together, 2 plus 3 plus 4 plus 5, C++ plus plus is going to simplify this left to right. It's going to take 2 plus 3 and give me back 5. And then the rest of this is plus 4 plus 5. Next thing it's going to do is take the 5 plus 4 and simplify this operand. It's going to do one operand at a time. And that's going to give me 9 plus 5. And finally, it's going to do the last operand. It's just simplifying them. So that's all chaining is. All right. So let me uh, go ahead and clean this up a little bit so it's actually going to compile and run, take out all of the little notes that I was making as I explained. And hope I got it all put back. So next I'm going to compile this, g++ cnexamples.com. That'll compile it, and it'll store it in this default location a.out. 
run that dot slash a dot out and run it it's perfect working okay enter an integer my favorite number is uh, 32 today so I type that and then it prints out you entered 32 that's exactly what we expected to happen all right I'm gonna pause the video uh, if you like definitely follow along try this out on your own do some experiments and I'm going to do a couple more versions of this example, just minor changes. So let me go make those changes, and I'll show you what I did. All right, I'm back. I just did a quick manipulation of this. I made a copy of these four lines right here, down below, and added some comment switches around them. If you guys don't remember how to use these, uh, so just this much right here, the slash star is a block comment. It's ended by the star slash over here. To activate this again with the switch, I can change this to slash slash, and now C++ is going to ignore the rest of the line, so it ignores that star. Down here, the slash slash means that it ignores the rest of the line, so it ignores that star slash. Now, because I'm declaring x twice, I've got int x here and int x here. I'm going to keep only one of these active at a time. And both of my blocks of code are surrounded by comment switches. All right, check this out. I can also use the comma operator when I'm declaring variables of the same type. So in this case, I'm declaring x and y. I'm going to have uh, this, a similar prompt enter two integers this time. And then I'm going to use cin in a chained manner to first read x from the keyboard and then read y. And remember, this is going to go left to right. And this cin uh, grab x essentially returns a new cin, and that cin will then grab y. And then I'm just printing out both of these. And again, using the stream chaining, uh, I've got printing X here, printing Y. That's the only difference for this one. All right, I'm going to save and quit. Let me just show you. We'll compile that, make sure I didn't make any mistakes, and then run this code. So enter two integers. Uh, you can actually see on the screen I was testing this just a moment ago. I can enter 5, space, 6, and then I get 5 and 6. If I run it again, I can type space, 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 four, space, 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 six, and it's going to ignore all those white spaces. Seeing is good about that. Run this again. I can even add a bunch of returns, and it's going to ignore all of those as well. It's just going to keep going until I've given it two integers. All right, I'm going to add a little bit more, and I'll be right back with a new version. All right, I'm back. I've got a very simple example here. It's almost identical to the first one, except instead of asking for an integer, I'm asking for a string. So string name, declaring a variable to hold that, prompting the user, what is your name? Then I'm going to grab the name, whatever they type, from the uh, keyboard, store it in the variable name, and then print out your name is, just to make sure that it worked. So I'm going to uh, switch focus back over here. And you can see I was testing this right there, but let me just walk through this. So compile again, make sure I didn't make any typos, and then we'll run the code. Your name, Mike. Okay, awesome, your name is Mike. Uh, so check this out, if I do this again, and now I want Mike Dosher, it's only gonna grab the very first thing and put it in a string. So I wanna go back and make a little modification to this and switch this up a little bit. So right now I'm asking for the name. Instead of using cin, in fact, I'm gonna keep this block right here for you guys. I'm going to copy those six lines, paste them down here. We'll make this look good. Um, instead of using cin, I'm going to use a different built-in function called getLine. GetLine takes two parameters. In fact, when I uh, pop that up, it's actually giving me some information about the basic usage. It takes a stream. In that case, I'm going to use cin. It's where am I going to get this from? Could be a file, could be a stream of any type, including the keyboard, could be the internet. And now I'm going to grab name. This is going to grab everything up until a, uh, it finds the return. So let me uh, save and quit, make sure I didn't make any mistakes, compile that, we'll run it. So it still works if I just use Mike. And now it works if I have any number of characters. Uh, all right, I'm going to put together one more example and I will be right back with this one. Suppose I'm reading a bunch of numbers in and I don't want to use get line. Uh, there might be a couple numbers per line. I might have multiple lines. So instead of what I'm going to do is I'm going to declare a variable sum. I'm going to start this out at zero. So I'm initializing this to zero. 
I'm also declaring an integer number to read the number in, and I'm not going to initialize that one. We'll get that in the loop. Uh, enter some numbers, end of line to end. Um, and then, just a quick note, end of line is Control-D on a Mac and Linux, and Control-Z um, followed by Enter on Windows. And then I've got a loop here. I can use CN inside of a loop. It's going to return true if I've given it the correct type. And it's going to ignore white space, including um, end lines, including spaces and tabs. Uh, so it'll just keep going all the way to the end of a file. So in this case, it's just going to read in a number. If it actually reads in a number, it's going to return true. If it reads in anything else, it's going to return false and should exit. Um, and we'll just keep going. It's going to just add up those numbers and then print out the sum. Uh, check the focus. Let's make sure I didn't mess this up. So we'll compile it. And then we'll run it. Dot slash eight out. out. Okay, so enters the numbers. One, two, three, four. If I type enter, it doesn't do anything. I need to enter that end of uh, line. I can put in more numbers actually. And then finally, it's control D. So I'm typing control D. And it prints out the sum. So if I run this again, and then I type some numbers, one, two, three, and then something that's not a number, it's also going to exit as soon as it hits something that's not a number. So in this case, uh, I'm going to type the letter A. I'm not sure this is real useful for people. Uh, probably is, actually, um, knowing that I can get around uh, bad input like this. Um, one other thing that I want to show you guys is input redirection. So if you remember from the terminal video, I can use echo to stick some numbers into a file. So this is the input redirection operator. Uh, echo is just going to type this um, output redirection, I believe. Sorry, output redirection. Because the output of echo is just those numbers, one, two, three. I'm going to put this in numbers.txt. Then I can run my same code, the executable a.out, and I can use input redirection to give it numbers.txt. OK? It's going to print this out. It doesn't actually print out numbers. Essentially, this is replacing the keyboard with this file. So CN is actually getting the numbers from a file when I do it like this and still printing the sum as 6. But it doesn't actually print out the numbers as they go through. OK, next up, I can also add addition. Here, let me just do this. Cat numbers.txt. We can see them. Can you load this up in Vim? There's my numbers. I can add more numbers to this by echoing 4, 5, 6. If I just do it like this, and then like that, it's going to say I can't overwrite an existing file. I need to delete it. But what I can do if I want to just append is add the double angle brackets. This is um, output redirection with append. And now I can just print this out and see that I've got two rows of numbers with an end line in there. OK? Um, that's automatically added by the echo function. And then I can do import redirection numbers.txt. It's going to take all of those numbers, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, add those up, and the sum of those numbers is 21. So it doesn't matter that there's a new line in there. It waits until it gets to end of file. Holy cow, did I say end of line the whole time? End of file, end of file, end of file. Sorry, but guys. Um, I'll go get that changed in the code. And when I upload it to Canvas and you guys look at what I'm doing, you can laugh at my mistake. End of file is what I meant. Oh, wow. All right, uh, next example. I want to talk about using strings a little bit. All right, final thing for today. Um, I just want to go over a couple of quick examples using strings, things that you'll need for the next homework assignment. So up at the top, I've still got IO stream because I want to be printing things out with C out. IO manip because I may want to change the appearance of things. Um, not sure I'll get to that for this. Uh, I feel like this is going kind of long. And uh, on string, so I can use all the string functions. Um, first up, uh, in main, I'm just declaring a string. I'm going to name it first and stick some letters in there, uh, an eagle. And then I'm going to create another string last, uh, six more letters in there, Montoya. And then I'm going to use uh, string concatenation and add the first and last name together. And then just print this out. Hello, my name is, and then the name. Uh, so let's just uh, go make sure I didn't make any mistakes before I start manipulating this. So g++ string example. That's going to store it in dot slash a dot out. So let's just run that and see what it says. Hello, my name is Inigo Montoya. Oh, it looks like I can use a space there. You guys can fill in the rest of that line. Uh, it's great fun. 
Let me go back here, we'll manipulate this. So I've got first plus last. I'm gonna go ahead and just use string concatenation one more time and add in that blank space. Let's try this, run it again. There we go, that looks good to me. Okay, back up here. Um, now I wanna just go over some, some of the string functions. So first up is length. So I can declare an integer and say that's equal, let's call it length equals, and then we'll just go with the full name, name.length. Uh, by just taking a variable that's a string and using the dot length function on it, that should return how many characters are in the string. Let's go ahead and try that out. So hold on, let's print that out first. My name has Well, I'm having trouble typing today. Really a lot of trouble. Okay. Yeah, I took my pre-workout this morning. It's loaded with caffeine, and then I never got a chance to my workout. And I'm feeling a little bit jittery. Okay. Hello, my name is Inigo Montoya. My name has 13 characters. Let's go ahead and take a look at this. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen. Okay, that's perfect. It's telling me exactly how many characters it has. Uh, please remember that all strings in uh, C are terminated by that uh, backslash zero null terminating character. We'll go more into that much later when we talk about primitive arrays of characters and how they're used as strings. But for now, all you need to know is that the length function actually returns the exact number of characters in the name. And you can, of course, test this on your own if you're ever uncertain. Uh, I'm going to go back and just change this a little bit. Instead of the length function, there's an alternative version uh, that's uh, used with arrays and vectors. Uh, that's the size function. So we'll compile, we run that. They work exactly the same way for strings. Strings just happen to have both of them available. To be honest, I feel like length makes a little more sense for strings. So we'll get rid of that. All right, the next thing I want to do is talk about, you know, I should probably leave that here. Hold on. We'll just comment it out. That way when you guys are lo looking at this at home, my size, there we go, that looks good. Hey, you will have, have like a little reminder that they both work. All right, next up, um, how to change individual characters. Uh, for a string, I can use the, let's go with first, character 0. I'm going to make that equal to, and in a character, I need to use the single quotes. We'll just make that an E. And then we'll print out the first name. Yep. Um, grab that line. Paste it. And instead of name here, I want to print just the first name because that's the only one I changed. First, there we go. Let's see if that actually does what I think it should. It's been a little while since I've done this. Yep. Okay, so right here is where I'm looking. It did change the very first character from an I to an E. Okay. Let's take another look at that code. So remember that strings and arrays in C++ are zero-based. So the very first character is going to be zero. Uh, if I want to change one more, grab two lines with two yy, p to paste them. What do you guys think? Uh, how about I and I? We'll do character four. We'll change that to uh, t. We'll run that again. Yep. So zero, one, two, three, four. Perfect. It's looking like it's working exactly like I want. All right, next up. Wrong one. There we go, Vim. So in this case, I'm going to do the append. Whoops. Uh, open up help. All right, quit the help. And just say, let's um, go with... Um, We'll just keep with the, the first dot append. 
I can give append another string to be appended. So this should work. And then we can print this out. And uh, I chose first because I wanted to be able to copy and paste that line. We'll run this again, compile and run. So in this case, append just takes another string and adds it to the end of this string. This actually is implemented very differently from Java. It's very efficient in C++, whereas Java reserves whole new memory block for the complete string and copies the whole thing every single time. Uh, correct me if that's been updated since I last learned Java. Okay, so that was append. Append requires a string. So I'm using the double quotes here for a string. I'm giving it a bunch of text. And in fact, um, we can use variables here as well. We just get another copy of this. And instead, we'll just use um, there. First is a string I've already got available. Compile that, run it. And now I've really butchered this guy's name. Anit Montoya. And then I've already got first stashed right here. I'm adding another copy with append using the variable name. So looks like that's working. All right. Um, then next up. If I want to just add individual characters to the back of a string, um, you know what? I'm going to do this real quick. I'm going to grab this code, paste it here, just so that but the name is not butchered. We'll just start with that. Next thing I'm going to do is I'm going to add some characters to it. So first, dot push back. This is going to add an individual character. So I need an individual character. So I'm going to use single quotes on this one. We'll add the space. Then we'll add the M. Then the O. All right, you guys get the idea. I could add all the rest of the characters for Montoya. Let's um, verify that this works. Oh, I didn't print it out. My bad. So I just need to grab this line, paste it right there, save that, and run it. So yeah, it's added the, oops, print the first name and it's added the MO to that. Let me pull up Vim real quick. I personally believe I typed that way too fast if you were trying to follow along. So I just wanted to have the code here on the screen. You guys will be able to download this code and watch what's going on. Uh, follow along and all the code will be here. Uh, available on Canvas. So you'll have seen all of this already if you downloaded that. Um, and if you're trying to follow along as I'm doing the lecture, uh, here we go. This is what it looked like. I'm using the pushback command to add single characters. I'm going to go ahead and throw some comments in here to kind of explain what I'm going, what I'm doing. Oh, wait, there's one more. There's one more. Hold on. Let me uh, go ahead and grab these first three lines right here. I'm going to use control V to go to block mode. I'm going to copy these lines right here with Y. And that'll give me a fresh Inigo Montoya. Uh, I need some tabs in there. There we go. Now I've got the full name there, Inigo Montoya. So the next thing I want to do is take that name and use insert. Insert requires two things. It requires where I want to start inserting from and the string I'm going to be inserting. So if I want to stick it in the, like, right after Nego, that's position 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5 will be right in front of the space. Position 6, I believe, will be right after the space. Then I can add my own string and we'll print this out again. Let's see. Right up here, I've got the line that's printing name. I'm going to copy that with YY, paste that with P, get rid of the blank line with DD, control right quit, and we'll run this and just see that we'll compile first, G++, then we'll run it. And now that last name, I should have inserted Mike right in the middle of his name, Inigo Mike Montoya, which I don't think sounds very uh, Spanish, but who knows? Maybe that is his real middle name. All right, so let's insert. I'm going to go back real quick. Uh, Control R, Vim, Tab. Good. 
and add some comments about what each of these lines are doing. I'll be right back. I can show you after I'm finished. All right, just to wrap up, I put some comments in so as you guys read the code, uh, first create some strings. We demoed length and size functions. We addressed individual characters using the bracket notation. This is the same way you would access an array in Java. Um, we appended strings using the append function, and this is strings. And I must stress that you have to use the single, uh, well, the double quotes here to add a string, or you could use a variable that contains a string. Um, <clears throat> and again, using append with the variable. And then over here, we can append individual characters. To do characters instead of strings, we need to use pushback. This uh, is a function that's available to pretty much all vectors and arrays. Um, <clears throat> vectors, my, my bad, not arrays. Uh, as well as uh, the other kinds of lists. Almost all have a pushback to add something to the end of it. Um, and then the insert requires a number, the position where we're going to be inserting in front of. Easy way to remember this is that zero will insert the beginning of the string, and since it inserts in front of the zero position. So in this case, I was inserting Mike before the sixth position to get the position uh, right after the right before the the last name. All right, that's going to do it for this uh, episode of C plus plus for Java programmers. So hopefully, uh, when you get to the next homework assignment, these will come in uh, and be valuable to you guys. Uh, have a great day.